Today I'm going to build an absolutely epic gaming system using the RTX 4070 Ti and the Intel 13600K. We're going to put everything into the Asus AP201 which is a compact yet feature rich case. Then we've also got some other Asus Tough products which offer a great value for money. There's some memory and storage from Seagate and G-Skill but of course I'll run you through all of these parts as we go throughout the video. So let's get building. So of course we'll start with our motherboard. I've actually done a full overview with this on the channel already if you want to check it out. This is the Asus Tough Gaming B760M Dash Plus Wi-Fi D4. The D4 meaning that it's using DDR4 they do have a DDR5 version if you'd rather use that so first of all we're going to install our processor and as I mentioned this is the Intel 13600k we've got 14 cores on this processor there's six performance and then eight efficiency there's 20 threads as well we've got a turbo up to 5.1 gigahertz now I am using a K series processor but with the B series board so we won't have any overclocking functionality if that's something you're looking to do then do get an MATX but in a Z790 board instead this one will be a case of something we can't do but i don't have a non-k processor on hand to use instead so i'm going to put up with it for this one so dropping that into the socket and then we'll just put the latch down the top will pop off don't forget to keep that handy in case you need to rma your board next up we'll do our memory which is some g skill trident z rgb this is a kit of 3000 megahertz you can of course go for 3600 if you'd rather that's a little bit faster but 3000 is what i've got on hand so opening up the second and fourth latch so furthest away from the processor with a gap in between. I'm going to line up our notch and get these installed. A couple of clicks on each one and then the same for the right hand stick as well. For storage I'm going to use the Seagate Firecuda 530. This is a one terabyte drive. I've used this for loads of different builds. It's been a really reliable, really fast drive as well. 7,000 megabits per second transfer, read and write. So blazingly fast. Just going to open the cover for our M.2 upside down on the left hand side in at 45 degrees push it down and then just turn around our little latch really nice feature on these boards it saves using a really fiddly screw then we're going to take the tape off the thermal pad keep that just in case and then install our cover again so that's a lot of the work done already on the motherboard there so now I'm going to get the back plate for our cooler then we can look at getting the motherboard into the case so the cooler I'm using is the Asus Tough LC240 ARGB. There's already a video on this on the channel if you want to check it out. I've done a video on this, the power supply, the case, the graphics card. I've done a lot of overviews and reviews already of these things if you want to look at them in a bit more depth. But this one is a very affordable cooler from Asus. It actually has performed very well in my temperature tests as well. So we've got a 240 for this one. This cooler was sent out by Scan Computers UK, who are one of the big UK retailers. They offer loads of different components, also some pro audio and video gear on there as well. We've got the bits we need. We've got a backplate here. There's the LGA 1700 screws. The backplate is already Intel. It does come with pre-applied thermal paste if you buy this fresh. I've used this before though, so that's why there's none on there. Let's first bring our motherboard in and turn it upside down and then put our backplate on. Just slots into place like so. Keep our fingers on it and turn it back over. Then we've got our LGA 1700 standoffs that we're gonna screw into the pegs that have just come through with the back plate. All of these can go in just finger tight as well. There's no need to kind of wrench them into the hole. So that's that back plate installed. That's not gonna go anywhere now. Now we'll get our fans ready. I'm gonna use a push configuration for the fans in this cooler. Easy way to remember which way the fan direction is. Nice clean logo is the way it's gonna go in. Then the kind of ugly side in the back is the way the air is gonna go out. I'm also gonna pay attention to the direction of the cooler as well. I wanna install it so it looks like this in the case. I generally have the pump hoses coming out the right hand side. You can do it on the left, it's more personal preference. But in order to keep the cables nice and tidy, I'm gonna put this down on the table with them at the top. Then I'll place my fan down with the cables coming out the right hand side. That basically means when it's installed in our case, the cables can come out directly behind the motherboard tray so they're not visible. Unlike if we were to have the fan the other way around, they'd have to go across the face. It just wouldn't look very nice. So by turning that fan around and having the cables come out directly down the motherboard tray, it can stay nice and tidy. Admittedly, that is a long winded explanation to try and help you get your cables nice and tidy, but I hope it made sense. I'm now gonna take these long screws that have got the pre-installed washers, thread them through the fans, and then screw them into the radiator. So those fans are all screwed in now. It will look something like this when you look inside the case. All of the cables coming out the back for nice cable management as well. So now we can bring our case in and start to get things installed. So the Asus AP201, I really like how easy it is to disassemble this thing and literally pop every panel off. Then we have our case ready to work on. Now, a little bit of a different orientation for this case than you'll see on other ones. We've got a power supply at the front. Let's get this little panel on the left-hand side off first. Four screws will let us take that panel out. 
and we can get easier access to the front and the power supply. For the front of the case, you've probably guessed it, more push pins. Now we can see the different notches for our power supply. So I'm gonna try and put it right at the top if I can, then it will give us a little bit more room to put a additional 120 mil fan at the front. Got our cable that runs from the back to the front for our power supply. Obviously a little bit different mounting, you generally have it in the basement of the case, but being this one's very small, we've got to do it a different manner. So we'll see how that goes. I'm gonna try and keep this as easy as I can in terms of cable management. So I'm not gonna use any powered hubs or anything like that, because that would mean another SATA cable. Just recorded, finishing this build for a good 45 minutes without any sound. So got a lot of technology. I've stripped everything back to where I was and I'm now gonna tell you about a few little changes that I made. So I've put all the additional fans that I mentioned into the case. I've got one as the rear, so it's gonna match the nice lighting we've got on the AIO. There are also two in the bottom. We've got these with the logo at the bottom, so the air's gonna be drawn in from underneath. There's also a nice filter that will go on like that. So it's gonna be filtered air going up through. That will help our graphics card be nice and cool. Hopefully get a little bit of extra that will go up to the AIO as well. I've taken out the rear fan of the case and I'm actually going to do a little bit of trickery with this to fit it in the front, but we need to get our power supply in first. And we're using the Asus Tough 1000 watt for this one, ATX3, 10 year warranty, 80 plus gold power supply. Full video on the channel if you wanna check it out. Now I've already put this into the bracket that's gonna mount into the front of the case with. I've got it fan side to the front of the case as we've got a mesh and everything, so it's gonna draw in some nice fresh air. A little bit curious about where the hot air is gonna go inside the case. Hopefully it won't be too drastic for our attempts, but we'll see it in time. In terms of cables on the power supply, I've got the motherboard, the two EPS connectors, there's one eight pin and then one four plus four. Then I've also got the 12 volt high power for our graphics card. So I'm gonna try and get this up as high as I can and hopefully use the very top little latches to hold the power supply on. Yep, just like that. And then I just need to screw in the screws I took out to get the bracket off. And now we get that screwed in, lovely. So one thing I was thinking about in terms of the fans, because I replaced the fan in the back so it all matches nicely, we have got the spare prime fan. This is just a standard three pin one, but I thought to add a little bit of additional airflow from the front, I'm gonna sandwich it into the front of the case at an angle. It's not gonna fit perfectly because there's just not enough room. If I had a slightly smaller PSU, it might have fit fine, but um, you know, it's your case, you can mod it, do what you want with it. And in this case, I want a bit more airflow. So we're gonna just sandwich this in. You can see where I tried to install it already. So I'm certainly gonna be opportunistic and use this to hopefully get a little bit more airflow into our case. So now we've got an additional 120 in the front. Should hopefully bring some nice air up through to our AIO. Is that an angle as well, which I think will help a little bit because we've obviously got the fans at the bottom for the graphics card. So now the power supply's in, we can get our motherboard installed. Fan cables hopefully won't get in the way. Now we're gonna take these little screws and get our motherboard screwed in. Just gonna install our power supply cable as well before we put our AIO in, because otherwise it'll be really difficult. Also, just looking at that, you can see it's gonna go backwards. If you were to put your power supply the other way, so the fan side in the case, you're not gonna get that plug in, so you do have to have it fan side to the front. I'm gonna run these cables through to the back now. So that's for our left fan and then the right one. We have got quite a bit of space, so I'm gonna do the cables that are on the AIO afterwards. Now I'm gonna position this AIO further to the back. It can take a 360 if you put the power supply a bit further down, but we're using 240. That does mean we can squish a 120 in the front, which I think is quite good. I think it'll look a little bit neater further to the exhaust 120 that we've got installed. So we're just gonna do the corners to begin with. Then we can let go of the cooler. Another little thing to note as I screw this AIO in, there are actually fins underneath where these screws go in. So be very careful, just do them up tight enough, not crank them down as hard as they possibly can, but just enough so you know it's sandwiched nicely without wrenching them because you can potentially damage some fins on this model. So now that's installed, we're gonna lay this down and we can put our pump top on. Now I've taken the cover off of this, I've used it previously before. You will have some pre-applied thermal paste if you're buying this new, then it will just be a case of putting it down onto your IHS. As I don't have any for mine, I'm gonna use some Noctua NTH2, but of course, if you've got some already applied, you need to skip this part. So just a little messy line of thermal paste for this bit. So now we'll put this down on, just kind of line up the pegs in between of the grooves. Then I'm gonna take these nuts and put them on each corner of the threads. I'm only gonna screw these on until they bite onto the threads. I'm not gonna start actually doing them up. This is just basically a way to be able to take your hands off the pump but I'm gonna go for the top left, bottom right, top right, and then bottom left. 
always applying opposite pressure. Same as if you do up a rim on a car, you don't do opposite so the pressure is evenly applied. Then we'll do the same with the screwdriver as well to make sure it's nice and tight. So I think this is about the third pass I'm doing now. We are getting to the bottom. Yeah, nice and tight now. So pressure is nice and even across the CPU. There we go. So then finally, the last cables, there's one for RGB, which I'm gonna pass through to the back. Hopefully you can see this. There is a four pin header just above the top VRM heatsink that I'm gonna plug our pump into. It's just a three pin for this one. That was actually quite tricky to do. I needed to do it looking top down, but that's now plugged in. This little bit of excess cable, we can just zip tight the back. So there's no loose cable in the actual inside of the case that's visible. And we've got the RGB cable going through as well. We'll just tuck that down by the dim slots. So that could be all tidied up later on. So we're making good progress. We're actually gonna get the graphics card in next, but before that, I need to install the front panel connectors because you cannot get them in after you put your card in. I'm afraid this is gonna be really tricky to show you guys, but just look at your motherboard manual if you're unsure on which pins are which. So now we can move on to our graphics card. For this one, we're using the Asus Tough Gaming 4070 Ti. This is the 12 gigabytes OC edition. Again, kindly sent out by Scan. They sent this monster out. There's a video on this already on the channel if you want to check it out. 1440p monster just obliterates anything that we put it on. Absolutely crazy. Um, but in order to get this ready, we need to just undo these brackets on the left. Just the first two for this case. Makes a bit of a change from using an ATX board, which will generally take out slots two and three, but for an MATX board, we need slots one and two. Drop this down in, line it up. We get a nice solid click to confirm it's in its place. Then we're gonna take our screws again, install them on the left-hand side, like so. Very nice. So now it's just a case of wiring things together. So I've got a 12 volt high power cable. This is gonna come up from the bottom. We've got a nice little run actually for this cable. And then it's just gonna basically go over and in, clips in like that, and then we'll just tuck that down with a nice kind of curve on the cable. There's no cable combs on this one, so they can be a little bit untidy, but if you use lots of cable ties or zip ties, then you can get it how you want it. That, I think, looks pretty clean in itself, that little curve there. Then it's just a case of getting our other ones plugged in. Then we're pretty much ready to boot. So for our 24 pin, we're gonna pass that up and through. This does then need to bend over husband of Eileen, and then plug that down into there. I might clip that in. Also got our USB 3. That again needs to come around and bend to go into its connector. I'm gonna try and separate these cables if I can, because they can get quite easily like bunched up. And then we've also got the USB-C, which again, there's another one that needs to be bent round. There we go. And last but not least, in terms of big connectors, we've got the EPS for the motherboard power which is going to go into the top now you can put these before the aio but in this case um, i found that you can actually do it afterwards because there is a, quite a gap um, on this case because it does support a 280 mil rad if you do use a 280 then definitely put it in before the radiator otherwise you're gonna have a bad time but as i'm using a 240 it's actually relatively easy to do after which is a welcome change so this is the rgb cable for the tough cooler it does come with a splitter included so i'm going to do that with this one, a three pin there. And plug into the motherboard header. There's actually two on this board, which is good because we need another one for the additional fans. So we've got the ones from the right hand side. And then we've got the power for the fans that are on the cooler itself. So that's the four pin that goes into that one. And the same for this one. And then that will then go back through we can put that on one of the optional headers. I tried to get away with it, but I couldn't. I don't actually have any adapter cables, which is unfortunate. They're all 12 volt rather than five. So we're gonna to have to use the adapter that's included with the fans, but not too much of an issue. You just need to run another power cable in for the SATA. So all these will just connect into the sides, just line them up and plug them in. So like I said, they need the power for the SATA there. And then the other end, we've just got a little cable that goes into the addressable on the motherboard. So fairly easy to use, but it's a shame how to use it. So managed to find a relatively short power cable with just two SATA on, which is really handy. So you need to plug this in into the power supply. Luckily, it's relatively close. And then just plug that into the SATA. I'm gonna use one in the middle because it can then tuck away nicely rather than a 90 degree one, which would be hard to try and get flush against the case. So we'll use that one there. Just need to get this other adapter for the additional fans. There is one at the front, which we need to plug in, but I'll just use the motherboard header at the bottom for that one. Then we've got the adapter for the additional fans that I put in just onto one header. Right, everything is now connected. 
Power supply is on. Let's see if we get a boot. Oh, looking very nice already. I do actually like the default Rambo Wave from the Asus products, very nice. g Good memory looks pretty good as well. Let's hope we now get a post screen. Oh, Mike is doing something. Oh, okay. <laughs> this has been very problematic, this build, trying to get everything connected and like cable managed and stuff so it looks semi-decent for the video. So I'm glad to see that post screen. So we're now going to go into the bar, so F1. Then we'll enable XMP, so on the left-hand side. Just drop that down to enable. So 3000 megahertz, 1.35 volts, cast latency 16. F10 to save and exit. And hopefully we can now get into Windows and play some games. Blimey, this has been a challenge, this one. So first of all, we're going to do Starfield. I'm running 1440p. These are the exact same settings that I used when I tested the 7800 XT last week. Nothing has changed. I've got V-Sync off and also motion blur because it's trash. You can obviously see the upscaling setting, but obviously there's nothing that we can use for this one. So we won't worry about that. Um, we're going to do a, I'm going to play part that's in the intro. So if you want to avoid any spoilers for this game then just jump to the next game. Um, but I'm going to run this and see how we get on. I'm using OBS to record this as well. So something to bear in mind. It does have a little bit of an impact to the frames, but only marginal. I'm just using OBS to record so you get a better resolution for the video. So now let's jump in and see how we get on. So initially, only at 60 frames, which I'm quite surprised at, considering the I'm in a really bad spot here. 69, 70 frames, a bit better. 73, 75. Okay, we're getting a little bit better results. But one thing I did notice is I was sat around 63 maybe 64 with the 7800 XT and then to be on the same with this card which is considerably more expensive is a little bit of an oof so 65 high 70 one percent low of 55 there but around 65 to 70 frames not quite as much as i was expecting to be honest we are using of course the ti model but like I said before in previous videos, this game does need a lot of work in terms of optimization, so I think that's why. So now let's jump on to the next one. We'll do Cyberpunk, which is another one of the intensive games, and see how we get on with that one. Now for Cyberpunk, again, using 1440p, I'm going to use a high preset, and then I'm going to turn ray tracing off just to begin with, as obviously not everyone uses it. Get a rough idea of what FPS we can expect without the ray tracing. Still does look very good anyway. Um, let's have a little run around and see what FPS we can get. Sat around 100 though at the moment, which is always nice to see. Ray tracing is the real crippler for this game. So let's have a little bit of a look. 1% low, around 82, 86. So very good actually. Let's turn ray tracing on quickly and just see how much it cripples <laughs> the. So I think we did the first three last time, down to 60 frames. So took off a good 40 straight away. 1% lows around 55. So definitely does impact a lot. I wonder what the lighting will do in terms of reducing it down again. I'll do it on, I'll do a medium. Oh yeah, 45 really took a hit then, blimey. So what benefit can we use by DLSS? Let's have a look. Let's go for balance to begin with. 80 on sharpness. And then we'll leave the DLAA for the minute. So from 45, 135. Wow. Blimey. I knew DLSS was good, but damn. Really nice jump there. Still looking very good as well. Let's go on to performance and try that on. 160 frames, well, I am actually hearing a little bit of coil wine from the card now. We do have a perforated panel on the side of the case as well though, so a bit more sound will get through than a normal case, but 180, 150 frames, well, very good, especially being ray traced as well. So around 100 frames when you're not using ray tracing, if you do want to put some ray tracing on, especially the lighting will just cripple it down to about 45, then you can just add another 100 by using DLSS. So. Very, very good with the AI technology there. 
So on to Dirt 5, everything is maxed out for this one. We have got a built-in benchmark, which we'll use so things are nice and consistent. Again, 1440p, absolutely cranked. And let's see what results we get from this one. And the results are in 170, oh, blimey, that's a lot more than I thought we were going to get. 170 average frames, minimum 27.1. Don't worry, because I do see that with every card that I benchmark. I think it's something to do with the game over the actual product itself. I might need to reinstall the game or something like that. But maximum FPS 221, low 1% of 143 really great result actually a lot better than i was expected very pleased now let's go on to our next game and see if we got on that one so on to apex legends again 1440p high and the things that i do have set a little bit differently are the texture streaming budget the filtering and also the spot shadow everything else is totally maxed out so the other settings are in the middle now let's go on to the game itself We've got again a preset run that i do so things are very consistent between graphics cards. 250 frames at the moment though, so well above the 7800 XT, if you're wondering. A little uh, teaser again there. Um, but we shall see if we get a little dip. 220, 159, okay. 222, yeah, I didn't phase it at all. Yeah. Absolutely smashed it. I uh, kind of expected that from this card. So well over 200 frames for the 4070 Ti on Apex Legends. There was only one little dip to 180, but otherwise absolutely solid over 200 all the time. So high refresh more like territory for that one. So next we'll look at Crisis Remastered. Again, a high preset on 1440p. I have got motion blur off and then ray tracing just to begin with. Again, this is very much like Cyberpunk. It does have quite an impact when you turn it on. So. We'll see what we get with and without, because I know not everyone likes to use ray tracing in the first place. Well, 200 frames a second there. Real nice uh, jump, 156. So well above 165 hertz, that kind of territory. I'm gonna turn ray tracing on now. Let's go for performance. 118, 130, so considerable dip. 100 frames lost there, just from turning on ray tracing. 172. So it certainly does obviously impact, but if you're not fussed about ray tracing, you can get a really steady high frame rate. You can even turn it up as well and kind of get to that 165 hertz zone for your monitors. So pretty good results again. So now let's go on to our last benchmark, which is Far Cry 6. For Far Cry 6, everything's set to high. We've got TAA for anti-aliasing, which is maxed out. Again, motion blur off, and then we're gonna use the built-in benchmark for this one. So we get nice consistent results between the different cards. So I'll let the benchmark run, and then I'll be back in a minute. So 127 frames is certainly not what I was expecting for this, and especially with the high of 153, I was expecting a lot more. So very interesting results there. It's actually pretty close to the 7800 XD as well, for anyone wondering. Um, but I think we need to do a little conclusion and I'll tell you about my thoughts on the overall build. Overall thoughts for the AP201, a great little system, a little bit tricky for a beginner to build in this. There's a bit of a limited area for cable management. There's a little channel, but there's no rubber grommets, so the cables will be visible through it. So you've really got to be meticulous about how you're going to plan your cables and things. I would look to spend about an hour and a half to actually tidy this thing up properly if it was going to be used, uh, get all the cables ran nicely. Just a little bit limited, of course, because of the size. A bit of extra depth probably would have helped as well because certain cables like the fan connectors are really touching the side of the panel, which uh, they're only you know a few mil thick, but it does add up. A little bit of extra depth would be nice, but maybe in a second version. There's actually a windowed version of this case available now as well. So if you do want to build in this and you want to have a window instead of the perforations, you can get that. It's not very much more expensive either. In terms of the performance of the system itself, we've got a high hotspot of 85.8 on the graphics card with room delta that was 60.2. They do run on the warmer side of these cards, but it does have a big old heat sink on there. So really not anything to worry about that kind of temp for this kind of card. And then we've got the CPU, so the 3600K with the tough LC cooler. So a high of that of 97, that was using Cinebench, but that is synthetic. So that will apply a lot more pressure and generate a lot more heat than every standard program. So that's more of an extreme test. That was a 10 minute throttle test, but you know, great performance in terms of the processor there as well. I did run Geekbench, Blender, Benchmark, and then also uh, 3D Mark as well. I'll put those all on the screen, all free to download, so you can download them yourself, compare against what machine you're currently using. 
those will all be on the screen. All the temperatures and things I'll put on there as well if anyone just wants to look at other parts of the cards and the processor. I did actually notice a little bit of coil wine. There was some in Cyberpunk and that was especially noticeable in Crisis. It does have perforations on the side of those, so of course it's not going to be limiting that sound like if you would have solid panels on the case. So I think if it was more like an under the desk system, it's not really going to be noticeable. Some of the games that we tested, you could see some ran better than others. Starfield, um, they do need a lot more optimization. Even with the 7800 XT that I looked at last week, I had about four or five frames extra with this card, which is obviously about 300 pound extra. So there are certainly some things that need to be worked on there because I would expect more of a jump. Far Cry and things, not quite what I was expecting. I did think that it would push a little bit more out. As you can see, we've got the 4K results of Far Cry on the screen now, and it had an average of 82. So if you're happy with console-like frame rates, then this is obviously suitable for that. I did build this to be more of a high ultra setting 1440p machine though, with higher refresh rates as well. But you can do both if you'd rather use 4K, especially if you're gonna run anything like a 4K panel for doing some editing or things like that, then that'll be capable for that as well. But overall, nice little system. Let me know what you think about it down in the comments box below. I'll add all the product links in the video description if you want to pick anything up. Big thank you to Scan for sending out the majority of parts that you saw in this video. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you all in the next one.